Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and today I will be reviewing Chapter 12. This chapter is called Global Marketing Channels and Physical Distribution. It is a very important chapter for a number of different reasons, and not the least of which is the fact that when you talk about channels, you're talking about an evolution, or you're talking about a su succession of events that are taking place within a, a business model. And what we're talking about here is uh, the idea that you take inputs. Those inputs come in to your business. They are then fashioned into whatever products that you're making, and then they're distributed finally to the customer. And the customer does not have to be the person that's using it. A customer can also be a wholesaler, it can be a retailer, or you can certainly deliver directly to the consumer. But of course, there are benefits to using a wholesaler, there are benefits to using a retailer. And so this chapter goes through some of the various structures of supply chains and also the length of the supply chain matters because there's always these two factors of time versus cost. If you ever run a business, and some of you will, you will note that all of the activities that you have in your business involve costs. And they also involve marketing activities. For example, if you have a business and you need raw materials, or you need components, or you need parts, or you need something that goes into the product that you're making. You have to get those from a supplier, that is, unless you produce them yourself. But let's say you don't have the efficiency to produce your inputs, so you have to get your inputs from someone else that specializes in that and that can do it at an efficient clip. So those inputs, uh, as I said, can, can be a, a number of different, uh, different items. Uh, in this book, this is a book that I got from a publisher. They used to send us a lot of books because they wanted us to adopt these textbooks for our classes. Now, I don't teach uh, logistics. I don't teach operations. I don't teach uh, production management or any of those courses that are associated with logistics. But I thought I'd hold on to this book because it has some very interesting information in here. And it, it, def it gives definitions and it talks about operations, which is a physical process that accepts inputs, uses resources to transform those inputs into valuable outputs. So you have the, the three steps that I just mentioned, the inputs, the production, the outputs. Now, obviously, as I said earlier, there are much more um, details given in that process. And later on, they talk about some of the different elements. They talk about procurement, which the, the procurement department, this is the department that is involved in getting your supplies. Now, these are actually marketing relationships because your suppliers have somehow convinced you that their supplies that they're presenting you are of the highest quality and at the best price. So somewhere along the line, they market it to you that those value propositions. Now you have other options. You can choose other suppliers for those components and for those materials and supplies. And that will come through also marketing relationships and some comparative analysis, looking at which supplier gives you the best material at the most reasonable cost. And you may very well change suppliers because the supplier you have may have gone up in price, may have not been timely enough, or may not give you the amount that you want. And all of these are disruptive to your supply chain. But those are marketing relationships. Also within your supply chain is the idea of R&D, research and development, looking at what 
types of processes are necessary in order for me to produce the product at the quality that I want. So you have your researchers, you have your designers, and you have your engineers who are looking at what it takes to make your product. Now the engineers will tell you, tell the managers that these are the products that we need, this is the volume we need, this is the time flow, and they will have everything mapped out. And they will use analytical models as well. Now, their wish list comes to you as a manager, and then you have to go out and find these materials. And again, that's a marketing process because you need to seek out not only uh, certain equipment and uh, certain um, perhaps the, the, the different technologies that are involved, but there are also certain standards that you have to look at in making these, these products. So th those are also marketing relationships, looking for companies that can supply you with certain types of equipment. And of course, this is not the input. This is the production process. And then that production process produces those products, which then become outputs. Now that they're outputs, they have to get to the consumer. And as I just said, the consumer does not necessarily have to be the direct point of contact for the company that manufactured the goods. You can go to a wholesaler. That wholesaler can certainly sell those to customers. That customer could be a store. Or the wholesaler could sell them to a retailer. And that retailer can sell them to a store and then that store sells them to the actual consumer. So you have a long line of events that occur in the supply chain. And then in the end, you want the after sales customer support. Uh, we can't forget that. To make sure that your customer is satisfied with the product that you're putting on the market. And whatever that feedback is, that loop should come back to you, the manufacturer, and then you will say, OK, we need to make some improvements on this particular model. And then you would go back to your engineers and your engineers would say, OK, this is what we need to do in order to meet this benchmark right, for quality. And so now you have all of these tools. You have business analytic tools. You have Six Sigma. You have project management certifications. You have all of these different things that are available. You also have uh, other tools at, in, at the, the point of sale that will show how consumers are reacting to the product, where they are buying, how much they're buying, how frequently they're buying it, and then what their impressions are. All of these events are extremely important because say, for example, your customer says, well, I don't like the quality of this whatever this is, then you may have to go back and look at your supplier relationships because maybe your supplier isn't giving you the quality you need and your customer has recognized that. So you may either have to tell your supplier, I need another model of this, I need an improved model of this, or you have to find another supplier to meet that customer's demand. When I was doing my MBA, I did a class called production management. I believe that's what it was called. And we were looking at optimization models in the way of perk charts. We were looking at all kinds of diagrams. We were looking at decision trees in terms of making decisions. And these models all had to do with optimizing um, the model for for costs and of course time. Time and cost are the, these two elements that we can't get away from because they say time is money. That's a cliche, but of course it's very true. And again, you have to look at the business as a an organic model, and you have to ensure that that your all of these processes are working together and that they're fully optimized so that your customer is getting the greatest value. And we know value is benefits over cost. And 
there you have it. In the in chapter 12, they talk about utility and those things that we value in terms of time, time utility, form utility. We have information utility. We have place utility. We have all of these, these things that are uh, working um, in a way that uh, benefit us. So uh, if you look at page 377, they talk about the, uh, the objectives. They talk about the categories that I just mentioned, the place, time, form, and information utility. And uh, I also, in this segment, talk about the evolution of shopping malls, and I think you'll you'll enjoy that segment. I, I actually give you uh, show you a lot of uh, pictures of old malls and what has happened over time, and then also what they're doing with malls in, in today's time. How they have uh, how they have made malls into centers of activity, and I think you'll find also find that very interesting. And we know malls is kind of one of the main uh, modes of, of distribution of products. You can get everything in one place and with variety and all kinds of uh, choices of, of products. Okay, so we're going to move on to the segment of chapter 12. I'll go through the slides and you'll notice that I'm, I'm wearing uh, a different shirt. So, so this was shot previously, um, but I think you'll you'll uh, certainly find the examples interesting, particularly the case of Union Carbide. Um, I like to put cases because you can always remember cases. You may not remember what's in the chapter, but you'll remember cases because these are actually real life scenarios that play out over time. And I believe you will kind of be able to connect the dots a little easier when you look at cases. Okay, so take breaks when you need to take breaks. And uh, again, uh, make sure you go through the material. And after this, we will get into chapter 13 and 14, which deals with global communication decisions. All right, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and uh, I will see you next week. Take care. So let me begin talking about chapter 12. Chapter 12, again, I believe is a very interesting chapter and I believe it is the nuts and bolts of business. When you talk about supply chains and we're talking physical products, for services, intangible products, it's a bit different. But for physical products, you have uh, products that are going through a channel. They have to, they require materials or components or ingredients. They are manufactured, they are assembled, they are made or created, and then they are distributed. So you have all of these stages again, and they have to be optimized. But if you're in a business, and let's say you go through the supply chain and you all probably remember the value chain as well. But if you go through the, the supply chain, and let's say you sell your products through retailers or whoever the, the, the end uh, distributor is, that is not the end of the story. Because part of the supply chain also is customer service. How do you ensure that your customers are happy with your product? Can they call on you? Can they get answers? Can they get advice? Uh, can they return merchandise that is defective or that they're dissatisfied with? That's also a part of this supply chain that we are talking about. So in chapter 12, starting on page 372, they have a case in here on Walmart in India. Everybody's trying to get into India, but here they were talking about some of the challenges of Walmart being in India. I think we've talked about Walmart in other places like Germany and the challenges they had there. 
But this one was Walmart in India. And what, what are some of their challenges? Well, first of all, you had the lobbyists who were concerned that Walmart, being the big retailer that it is, would essentially destroy the local Indian businesses. It says Western style big box retailing is anathema to many Indian activists and policymakers who feel that Walmart will drive some of the Indians millions of shopkeepers out of business. Legislators are also suspicious of the company's motives and attitude that can be traced back to the colonial era and the operations of the British East Indian Company. There was also another event that happened in India that caused a lot of uh, cynicism towards global corporations, and that involved Union Carbide. It was a case that occurred in Bhopal, India, where there apparently was a gas leak. And overnight, the gas leak um, or the gas was emitted all through the environment and people woke up with burning eyes and their mucous membranes were just on fire and you know people were vomiting and and they were going into these seizures and uh, people died as well and, and they were trying to figure out what happened and it, and it was determined that there was a gas leak at the plant and so of course, the Indian government wanted to hold Union Carbide accountable for, for this gas leak. And Union Carbide essentially said, well, it was um, operator error. It was a local error. It wasn't the fault of Union Carbide. But of course, as a company, you're going to have to have some type of um, responsibility or to be accountable for that. That was a very bitter uh, situation with uh, these companies uh, going in and um, India having the memory of that tragedy. And then you fast forward to Walmart coming in and they have some some uh, some reservations about it. Um, understandably so. So if you look at distribution channels, we know that distribution channels, and we're shoppers, so we know this very well, that you have lots of benefits. Uh, we're all consumers, so we, we, we shop for products and we look for services to be rendered to us, and we want them to be convenient. We don't want to have to go halfway uh, or go around town or across town to, to get something that we want. So you have all of these utilities, and these are things that we value. So if you remember in the very first chapter, if I can go back to the first chapter, there was a formula that was talking about value. And what is value? Well, they say, uh, if you look at page five, it says value equals benefits over price. So that is the utility. We want value. And value can be defined as a benefit. What are those benefits? Now, a company is supposed to provide you with a value proposition or a benefit. And sometimes that, that uh, benefit can be that something is 
um, more makes life easier. It makes things um, more convenient. It's cost of, it saves you money. It saves you time. Those are value propositions. So here in terms of utility, and you see marketing channels exist to create utility for customers. So you look at place utility. How easy is it for you to get the products that you want? Do you have adequate outlets, retail outlets, where you can get the product? Is it convenient? Do you have to drive all the way across town and take time and money in order to get that product? Because otherwise, you, you may not do it. If you have to expend time uh, and money in order to get a product, then you may not do it. If you look at value, it says benefits over the price, benefits over price. So in your denominator, price or cost are those things that you spend in order to get the benefit. So in the denominator, if cost increases or if price increases, time increases, effort increases, that means your value is less. You may value it less because it takes more to get the benefit. If those things in the uh, denominator decrease, if the price decreases, the time decreases, the costs and all the other things that go with the price, then your value is greater. So if what's in the denominator prices decrease, value increases. If what's in the numerator benefits increases, value increases. So you have those, those um uh, dynamics as far as utility is concerned. You're looking at form utility. Uh, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, you see a lot of people who are there buying all kinds of materials, ready-made materials. If they want to put up a fence, you will have partitions of fencing that you can put up yourself. It's in the form that's already made. It's already nailed together. You don't have to buy planks of wood, cut the wood, measure the wood, and nail it together yourself. This is a form utility that we value because it cuts down on what? The time and perhaps the cost of you messing up. How many of us have had a project at home or have seen someone engaged in a project and they mess up. They got to run back to the store. They got to get other materials and maybe they didn't do something right and they got to start over. It just creates a, a, a big waste of time. Uh, and, and if you have something that's pre-made, that is a form utility that, that we value. Then we have information utility, availability of answers to questions and general comp communication about useful product features and benefits. So where do we go to get our information these days? Many of us go to the internet, yes, but we may look at product reviews. We may look at what do customers say about this product? What do they say about the drawbacks? What do they say about the benefits? What do they say about the use of the product, the ease of use? And these are things we value because, of course, we want to lower the perceived risk by making sure we're making a good decision. And the only way you can make a confident decision is if you have the information uh, uh, be be prior to the purchase uh, that you're making. So these are all forms of um, utility that we, we value. So distribution is the physical flow of goods through channels, as we talked about, of course. These are physical products that go through. And what matters is the length of the channel and the shape of the channel. And most, when you say channel, it kind of assumes that you have a beginning point and you have an ending point. So you have the buyer and the seller, but the entire supply chain represents procurement as well, but the distribution channel 
is essentially how does that consumer get the product? How is it distributed? So it says channels are made up of a coordinated group of individuals or firms that perform functions that add utility to a product or service. So if you're a manufacturer and let's say you are, um, uh, you want to get your products out. You have a number of choices. You can go to retailers, you can go to wholesalers, or you can sell direct. There are lots of different channels. And if you look on page 374, they have six different types of channels. So starting at the left, these are more of direct channels. So now you have this idea of e-business, internet. You still have mail order. You have interactive TV where you know people shop and they get a number. There's a number on the, the, the TV screen. And so then they call a number and... Uh, and then they put their the, the corresponding number for that product in and they get their products mailed to them. Then you have door to door, which is something that has really gone out of vogue in the United States. You don't see much of that anymore. Uh, when I was growing up or shortly, probably a little bit before my time, you had people selling goods door to door, whether it be cosmetics or whether it would be encyclopedias, whether it would be the uh, religious literature, um, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses would go door to door. You had the Muslims that would sell newspapers and uh, frozen fish door to door back in the 70s. That was a thing. And this was kind of a more personal relationship that you develop uh, with your customer. It just so happens if you uh, look on page 376, they talk about in Japan where cars are mostly so sold door to door. Now, that's a very novel concept because most of us, we go to a dealership and they have a showroom and we look at the cars or we go to the lot and we have a salesperson that comes out and they give us all the information we need to make the, the purchase or not. But it talks about this, the whole idea of Japanese car buyers expecting numerous face-to-face -face meetings with a sales rep during which trust is established. So you have that whole uh, idea of sizing the person up that's selling you this product. And so they don't have the showrooms as we have here, which is a, a very interesting uh, idea in terms of how cars are sold. Then you also have outlets. Some of these manufacturers will have their own outlets, like you have the Apple Store. At one time, you had... Um, um, you had um, a gateway store, which is was another computer brand. Uh, those physical stores uh, eventually closed, but uh, you had these these types of stores that were specifically for that manufacturer's products. And of course, the Apple stores are very uh, successful. But then you look at some of the other channels, and these are indirect channels. So you have retail outlets involved and in the second you have a manufacturer's sales force which may or may not be part of the same company you can hire independent salespersons to uh, sell your products to a retailer and these may be people that are specialized in certain types of products and they may have various accounts they may have various manufacturers that they work for to help move their products into the retail channel. 
Then you have uh, agents and brokers, uh, which connect buyers and sellers. And for a commission, it gets the manufacturing and retails together. Then the fourth channel here is the sales force sells to the wholesaler and the wholesaler sells to the retailer. So, for example, if you have a situation, let's say I am a, um, a person that sells um, bread or some ba um, baking pro bakery products and I make, uh, I make these products in volume and so I need someone to help me distribute them. So I hire a sales force or maybe it's my sales force. That sales force sells to a wholesaler. Now, the good thing about a wholesaler is a wholesaler will buy in great volume. Now, of course, you have to give them the wholesaler's discount. That wholesaler has large inventory. And what they do is they sell it to different retailers for also a markup. So you have value being added at each point. You as a manufacturer, you don't have the distribution channels. And so the wholesaler, which has a network of retail outlets that they can sell to, is value added because it makes the product more accessible. And then the wholesalers will sell to retail outlets, which have even more outlets that are in the neighborhoods that are close by that makes it more convenient so you have time utility you can access those products uh, very quickly and then you have of course the um, the sales force that can sell to both wholesalers and retailers and which is also um, you know, serving for a value added in, in terms of getting that product to uh, ultimately the customer. Okay, so you can kind of see the how how this and these supply chains work. Um, you have the option to use a sales force, agents, and brokers. You have situations where manufacturers can deal directly with wholesalers, and uh, and ultimately, the products go through a retail channel and then to a customer. And this depends on, again, the type of product that you have. If it's a perishable good, of course, you want your products to, to be, um, to move through the supply chain very quickly. You want the supply chain to be very short. One of the things that I want to show you when we talk about this distribution channel, and I showed this to my global business class, these are what we would consider normal channels, but are there other options? When you go to developing countries, if you go to Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean and Africa, you'll see street vendors. And these street vendors have a very interesting model. Some of these street vendors, and you'll see hundreds of them out, and I'll show you a clip in a minute, but you'll see hundreds of them out in the street hawking all types of products. Do these individuals make these products and then go out in the street and sell them? Well, in some cases they do. But many of these street vendors actually buy from manufacturers and they get a commission based upon what they sell. So if it's bread or if it's peanuts or whatever the product is or if it's some kind of snack, they will get an amount from the manufacturer and they get a commission on sales and they sell them out in the street. And it, it is just an amazing sight to see. And here's a quick clip of that. The cops are on. Yeah. The cops are on. Now we are in Central Region, right? Cafe? Oh, cafe. Where is that? 
So let's talk about global retailing. So let's, uh, this is more or less the physical channel, but the online channel has increased. And I believe the last uh, review I did showed you the progression of how the online channel has taken off. So you have the idea uh, online of business to business, business to consumer, consumer to business, consumer to consumer. So this is like an e-business matrix, a two by two. Business to business is represents the largest in terms of revenue because you're talking about businesses buying from other businesses. So for example, if Florida A&M wanted to buy carpet, or if they wanted to buy office furniture, they would buy from another business. And typically they will buy it in a volume so that it is consistent across campus. And typically you would have the same customer, business to business. Then you have business to consumer, which is probably represents the most common form of e-business transaction. The business actually selling to the consumer online, us going on to a website, using a search engine, going to Amazon, and then buying these products from a number of businesses. Um, Amazon or you have third-party sellers also on Amazon's site or any other site that's uh, online. And again, it is, it is increasing. Then you have C2B. What is C2B? Some of the earliest companies dealing in C2B was Priceline, where as a customer or as a consumer, you can set the price. I want to take a, a plane or a flight from Tallahassee to California. I go to Priceline and I say, I want to go to California for $300. That's my bid. So they then look for options and look for sellers of a ticket from Tallahassee to California for $300. Then they'll come back and say, your offer has been rejected. So then you have to rebid. So now 350, 375, 400. Then they, at each bid, they will go back and look for a seller of that ticket and then we'll come back with an answer. Now, bear in mind the early days of Priceline, and I, the first time I used Priceline, I got a ticket. They didn't tell you what the itinerary was. And so when I got my ticket, it was a red-eye flight, and they had two connections, and it was absolutely awful. And I said, never again. I think since they will allow you to see the itinerary first so you can make that decision. What are some other forms of C to B? Well, with C2B nowadays, you have a lot of social media influencers who are now changing the entire consumer uh, cycle in terms of who we believe. Do you believe the company? Do you believe a consumer when it comes to choosing products? 
So now these social media influencers wield a lot of power and you have these companies actually paying them to pitch their products and use their products and to endorse their products. And so that becomes another C to B model. You're you're a consumer and you have this company that is giving you products to endorse or that is actually paying you money. And you can set the, the, the terms and a lot of times they'll look at how many people you have, how many subscribers you have, how many followers you have uh, to determine how much that they give you, how much free stuff they give you, how much they give you in compensation to endorse their products. So that's a kind of relatively new C to B model, but it is a very powerful one as well. So one interesting uh, social media influencer that uh, I learned about a couple of years ago was Yolanda Gamp's YouTube channel, How to Cake It. And what she does is she, she will take something and she will make a cake out of it. And it's absolutely fascinating the range of talents uh, that she has in terms of artistry and creativity. And it's just really amazing. And so during her uh, demonstrations, she will talk about the different products that she uses in terms of utensils. And she will basically endorse these products. And then she will have in the, in, in the notes section of the video, she will have all of this information about the things that she uh, uses. And this is a very, uh, again, a very powerful um, connection when you talk about what a consumer wields in terms of power over uh, companies. Then finally, you have the C2C model or what they would call peer-to-peer. -peer. Well, you have consumers marketing to consumers. They used to call it uh, C2C, consumer-to-consumer, or P2P which is peer-to-peer -peer marketing. And eBay was the first company that pioneered this idea. You empty out your closet and you put these things on auction and you sell for whatever the, the bids are. So that's a very interesting way of, um, you know, in terms of su supply chains on, online, that is about as basic as it gets. So talking about global retailing, how does it differ? Well, not much, but there, there is a, a difference in how different societies will look at shopping. When we did the best frozen foods case that you'll notice that the idea that a shopper will shop every day for their dinner would be a unique thing in the U.S., because you typically shop for a week or, you, or these days you're buying enough for a month. People are going to the store and they're buying shopping carts filled up because they want to make sure that if they have to do a two week quarantine that they're covered. But in many places, particularly Europe, they were shop for that day, for that meal in the evening. And the next day they would come back. And they would shop for each day of the week. And we might see that as inefficient, but that, that's certainly a, a totally different mindset. Also, if you go abroad, you may notice, and you go to a mall, you'll notice that the malls have a kind of a different purpose. Here, it's a place where you might go to kill some time with your friends. You might go to get a snack to eat, do some window shopping, maybe buy a couple of things. But malls in many places are family outings. You go to the mall for a family outing. You'll see the entire family walking together, going through the mall and shopping and sitting down and having a bite to eat. In some of these malls, there are ice skating rinks, there are all these kind of activities. And so you do have some differences, but when you go into a mall, it looks the same. All of these malls um, look similar in terms of their function. 
So some of these, if you look at global retailing, you look at department stores, specialty retailers, supermarkets, convenience stores, and the like, those are all similar in terms of their function. Here are the top five global retailers, and you see Walmart at the top, Carrefour, which is a French company. You'll see a lot of those, uh, of course, in Europe, but also in Africa. Tesco, which is a British retailer, had a foray into the U.S. and they didn't, they didn't make it here for whatever reason. Maybe it's the feel of the store was not the same. Aldi, which is uh, one of the stores that uh, I believe Dewan mentioned in the Best Frozen Foods case of establishing some kind of partnership. Best Frozen Foods establishing a partnership with Aldi's to get the frozen goods through the store. And here we know Aldi being a discount store and it has the same persona um, back in Germany where it's headquartered. I do want to say something about shopping malls uh, because there's there's been kind of a, a phase of shopping malls becoming uh, very popular maybe in the late 60s, uh, in the 70s, they had this, uh, this, um, this idea of these social places, sh these shopping malls that you would go to. And you had everything right there. You had all of these different stores in one place. And, but over a period of time, shopping malls have, have uh, changed. And you might wonder, why are shopping malls changing? Now, most of you probably will say, well, the Internet. The Internet has really taken the, the sting out of, you know, going to a mall, driving across town to uh, get my products. But really shopping malls were more social watering holes where you would go and you'd buy something and you'd hang, just hang out basically. You know, you had arcades there and maybe you'd hang, go play a couple of games and get something, get a snack to eat. But here's an article that says, never mind the internet, here's what's really killing, here's what's killing malls. And they go, and I actually have the article here. Uh, this was a New York Times article, February 16th. And it says, big box stores. So here they're talking about standalone big box stores that people may go to as opposed to going to the mall. In fact, there was a trend that a lot of companies were beginning to move their their stores out of malls into these these uh, single areas where they were standalones. And they found that that was a trend because the rents were too high in malls and they felt that they had more control over when they would open, when they would close and the other uh, other regulations that malls usually will have in order to ensure that there is some consistency. Income inequality, which is something that we might not have considered. And then they talk about the rise of services. Uh, not only, of course, online has a lot to do with that, but it says we spend more on education, entertainment, and business services and all types of other products that aren't so in traditional retail stores. So there you have it in terms of the impact on shopping malls. And of course, the Internet is a big part. They actually make a point here at the beginning. And they say that Internet shopping still represents only 11 percent of the entire retail sales total. So we're actually still growing in that space. Also wanted to show you a couple of other things. Here's an article that I read, I think it was last year, talks about why the deaths of malls is more about, is more than shopping. So you see an abandoned mall here. And they talk about all the socioeconomic trends, just as you uh, saw in the last uh, article that I showed. 
and it talked about how a lot of the companies are closing hundreds of stores. But what they go on to say is that many of these stores have begun to uh, change their philosophy in terms of what stores are now being used for. Malls, malls are being used for, rather. And so they're saying that now, instead of just shopping, people are going to malls to actually do things. It talks about the types of activities, bowling alley, comedy club, indoor rope climbing course, of course, rock climbing as well, and all these other activities, making malls more centers of activity rather than shopping. So that's kind of a, an angle that a lot of malls are being remade into uh, centers of activity more so than shopping. And of course, if you have children, it's the perfect place that you can go get some shopping done. They can play their games, you know, in the play pens, all the other activities. They have these rides where you put a child in and it swings them up and down. I mean, they have all these types of activities. Uh, which is where malls are now trying to uh, make a make um, make more of an impact. Here's an article that I found that has a collection of photos of abandoned malls around the U.S. and it's actually a very spooky and it's just a collection of photos. It's not doesn't have much. Uh, there are some captions, but uh, there's not, nothing in terms of commentary. They do give uh, the number of malls closing, 8,600 closing so far in 2019. But just to look at some of these malls is very uh, disturbing because these are places that we remember gathering and hanging out with friends, buying things, and these places were packed. But you look at some of these places and it's just like a, a literal ghost town. And again, very sad, you know, what has happened in many cases. A lot of these retail outlets have filed for bankruptcy, Montgomery Wards and Sears and many of these stores were the mainstay of malls. You would go to the mall just so you can go to that that store. Yeah, very sad. Most of us had, had never seen these types of images. Everything has to change though. You know, nothing lasts forever. Here's another article that I found. This is from January and it talks about how malls are reformulating themselves and this one features Aventura Mall near Miami, which some of you may be familiar with, and you may even frequent the mall. And this one has a giant slide. It's nine stories, and it has lots of other activities. Emphasizing low-tech entertainment over cutting-edge gadgetry, Aventura is betting that brick-and-mortar retailers can beat online vendors without having to play their game. So it talks about whimsical sculptures, a terrace line party venue, and carnival style games of chance. And of course, as the other article said, you can get all types of services uh, at these malls. And then you have the pop-up shops. By the way, Victoria's Secret, that's a specialty shop in the Cheesecake Factory, I understand, is uh, having trouble, is having problems now, and may, may be considering uh, bankruptcy.
they have a lot of eye candy in shopping malls these days. Uh, sculptures, as was mentioned. And it says here in the article, I think human beings are social creatures, which is why they go to Starbucks even when they can make coffee at home. A couple of things here. Of course, you can make coffee at home, but it's not the coffee that you would get at Starbucks. You may not have all the ingredients. You may not have the variety and the choices. And if you try to replicate a Starbucks drink, it might cut into the value because, of course, it would take more time and it would cost more for you to do it rather than a cafe that has all the equipment. Here are more sculptures. Yet another sculpture. Okay, so that's the state of shopping malls today, and they're making a comeback, apparently. But essentially, you have some of the same issues overseas, chain acquisition, companies buying other companies to gain access to distribution channels, joint ventures. You have other market entry strategies. And you have this uh, matrix here, strat uh, market entry strategy framework. So here you have supply chain definition. Supply chain, you have heard, you have uh, heard of uh, distribution channel, and of course you have order processing and then warehousing. Warehousing is very interesting because a warehouse is is overhead. I mean, you have to pay for that space. But you had a, a very interesting model back in the beginning of Dell Corporation where they had a direct from Dell uh, strategy, which was to make computers on demand. So if I called up and I wanted a specific type of RAM or hard drive or monitor, I can actually put that together in a customized way and Dell would fill that order. And of course, you would pay a premium. But... Uh, they had a situation where their warehousing was uh, was they did not pay a lot of money on warehousing components for their computers. They would order directly from the supplier and then they would make the computers as they were ordered. So it was called a direct from Dell model and their inventory turnover was every 48 hours, if I recall correctly. Here are some other methods of transportation. We talk about getting the products from point A to point B. This is a matrix showing the various uh, costs and benefits. You look at rail, water, truck, air, pipeline, and internet. And you, you, you look at the various um, points in terms of what makes each uh, transport method advantageous over the other. So that's going to do it for chapter 12. I will say a few things about 13 and 14. It both deal with marketing communications. And so you get into this whole idea of promotion. And if you decide to pursue this subject in more detail, you will take something like advertising, you will take something like public relations, and it will give you more detail as to the dynamics of how communication strategies are laid out. Of course, advertising being a part of marketing. Marketing is the umbrella where you have sales, advertising, you have um, customer relationship management, you have uh, e-marketing, e you have consumer behavior, you have all of these different aspects of marketing that is the umbrella of which advertising and public relations are a part. 
there was a study done. We, we know about Theodore Levitt, but there was a study done by Eric Ellender, and you should remember Eric Ellender, who was really the first one to look at this standardization strategy versus customization. But the study he did was for advertising. He was looking at how products can be promoted using a global theme. And again, his name is Eric Ellender, and he kind of looked at this standardization versus adaptation strategy back in the 60s. And it wasn't until 20 years later that Theodore Levitt came up with a similar idea about products. So you have products versus promotion. So on page 410, you look at some of the options, global advertising content, standardization versus adaptation. And unfortunately, they don't mention Eric Ellender's name, but the, the idea of advertising has, even though you have the big advertising companies, you have a lot of uh, various platforms when you start talking about how advertising is done, especially online. If you look on page four, 414, you see all of these av advertising companies, global advertising agency companies. Public relations is interesting because a lot of foreign companies have to use these services because it is a way to uh, tell your story. Basically, as a, a public relations, it's to tell a story. And you tell a story as a co foreign company in a, uh, a country, you want to make sure you, you're telling that story in a way that is acceptable to, to that uh, in that country and brand management and marketing is is new in a lot of places and when I say new I mean 20 years 25 years you, you don't have the same emphasis in marketing in many countries as you do in the United States so there's a, a very different feel as to what's acceptable in terms of marketing uh, marketing and advertising then you have in chapter 14 sales promotion how you promote sales um, using various uh, methods then they even talk about some marketing research uh, sampling uh, personal selling couponing is couponing acceptable some of you in the best frozen foods case has suggested that there would be couponing in Germany of course you would have to find out if that's something that's acceptable in that market so looking at page 448 you have this six-step presentation plan and this is for selling you may have heard this before where you have the approach presentation demonstration negotiation close and servicing the sale when I worked in the computer industry I was on sales calls and I didn't know about the six step presentation plan that that wasn't something that I was given because I was more of a marketing support rep. It was the salesperson that would have gone through these steps. But I remember going to a sales call with a sales rep and I was intent on talking about how great our products were and the value that they can get uh, for the product that we were trying to sell them. But the system administrator essentially said to me, he says, well, I don't need all those things. But I was intent on, well, this is the value that we give for this product. But the lesson there was that you want to be a good listener when you're selling. And it's not necessarily that the, the customer may want all the things that you're saying. They may want one specific thing, and then you tailor your presentation to that particular element that they're looking for. So the approach is, of course, very important going in. But this may differ because when you get to negotiation, now that's where culturally things are done differently. Sometimes no negotiation is more elongated, that you don't come to a meeting necessarily with the idea that you're going to close a sale. That might be a preliminary meeting. 
then you may close that meeting and say, okay, now we're going to do a strat uh, uh, another meeting to look at the long-term effects of this purchase. And then you have another meeting after that. And then now you go into the negotiation process that might deal with the actual numbers that they're looking at. And, and then the close, the close can be you signing all these papers or in some places they may expect that, okay, in good faith, this deal is done and you're thinking about paperwork where in some places they're not so quick to push papers and get all kinds of signatures. So there's a difference in the flow of how negotiations are conducted and also what constitutes finality uh, in a process. One of the, th the things that they uh, mention in the book was billboards being banned in Brazil. And I think there are a couple of other places in where they now have banned billboards. Uh, I don't know if it has to do with just the um, visual pollution of, of having all, all these uh, billboards. But I will read a bit. It's on page 457. It says, the clean city law came about from a necessity to combat pollution, pollution of water, sound, air, and the visual. We decided that we would start combating pollution with the most conspicuous sector, visual pollution. So you have a kind of a minimalization of the way ads are now presented in some of these countries. I believe India may be another one of those countries. India, the Philippines, and Brazil have decided to take different uh, approaches on how advertising is done outdoors. Well, that will do it for the last presentation. Uh, this was very interesting, uh, specifically about the malls and the direction malls are taking, trying to reformulate themselves. And again, the whole online platform and how that has really shaped the way we consume uh, products, particularly in a time like now where most of us are relying heavily on online purchases to stay clear of crowded places. Uh, I hope that you all are making progress on your projects and I look forward to seeing them on Wednesday. Take care.